Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Wiggle Wednesday. I'm Troy Hinky. Um, Steve is off on one of his expeditions today doing his pilot thing, so it's just going to be me today. Um, I know the date on there is wrong, that's because I'm not very techy and don't know how to change the dates on these things, but today we're going to be talking about worm reproduction. So we'll get into the juicy details of how worms get it on and then cocoon production and the time frame for all that and what takes place. Uh, first of all, if you were joining in last week and you, uh, when the interruption, my service was interrupted at the end of my um, presentation, uh, I was not forewarned that the uh, internet company was going to be out here working on my internet. So uh, I apologize for that. Uh, it, I went outside after my presentation. I just happened to go outside and saw two trucks nearby that they had uh, turned off the internet. So I don't know why they couldn't send out a warning, but um, that's what had happened with that. Uh, this weekend, we're coming up on the NC State Vermiculture Conference. Hopefully some of you all have signed up either to attend in person or online. We just got an email yesterday that said that for anyone who's attending either in person or online, there's going to be a private YouTube link available so that you can go to it at any time and view the uh, whole conference. So if you've been kind of on the fence about whether or not to attend and want to know if that's going to be available and worth the money, then uh, I just wanted to let some of you all know that. Uh, and with that, I will get going on worm reproduction here. So let me get the banners turned off and let me share my screen. Give me just one moment. Hope everybody's having a good uh, autumn day here. Things are really getting cold in Pennsylvania. It's been dropping down to near uh, freezing the past couple of nights. All right. So today we're going to talk about worm reproduction. Uh, learning the reproductive cycle of red wigglers can help worm farmers to successfully increase their population. So if you know the time frames of when things are supposed to take place, you can uh, monitor your worm bins and use special worm bins to breed worms in case you're wanting to up your population. So if you're wanting to increase your worm army so that you can get more worm bins going or possibly sell worms, this is going to uh, give you that information. So first we're going to go through how worms copulate and the whole process of what they do to get together. Uh, and then we're going to go through cocoon production. And after that, we'll discuss sexual, mat sexual maturity of worms and then go through some of the best conditions for breeding. And then we'll go through our regular Q&A. So first up, uh, worm copulation. So worms are a bit different. I think most people who have worms and who've done any research know that they're hermaphrodites. So they contain both male and female reproductive cells. Oh shit, I just realized I didn't uh, share my screen. So give me one second. Uh, I apologize about my uh, use of language there. Sometimes I'm so excited to get going on things that I uh, don't pay attention and just get going on them. So now we should be sharing the screen. Let me make it full screen. Uh, so there was my first slide uh, about going through copulation, cocoon production, sexual maturity, best conditions for breeding, and then we'll go through the Q&A. And then uh, as far as copulation, I was saying that worms are hermaphrodites, so uh, they breed a little bit differently and uh, egg, fertiliz egg fertilization or ova fertilization takes place differently than um, what we're used to with, you know, uh, things that generally uh, hatch eggs or the way that mammals reproduce. So uh, red wigglers or Asinia fetida are hermaphrodites that can't self-fertilize. And when they are in the soil or in a worm bin, they're going to be attracted to each other uh, to have this reproduction by glandular secretion. So just like in humans, we're attracted to others by pheromones that we don't even necessarily realize or these uh, secret scents that we give off, um, worms in a same similar manner are uh, attracted to each other to have reproduction by these glandular secretions. So it starts off by them starting to 
uh, get together and they will both, two worms will secrete this mucus that forms a slime tube over each clitellum region. Uh, the clitellum, for those of you who don't know, is that little band that forms uh, uh, several segments from the head of the worm. So that, you know, you'll have a lot of segments that are equally uh, distributed, and then you'll have this wide band that goes around there, and that's called the clitellum. Um, so they'll start to mate. They secrete this uh, mucusy liquid that forms a band around that section to kind of lube things up. And then uh, they face opposite directions and they connect at the clitellum. And I've never been fully sure, but it appears that they enter inside each other's clitellum. And then they connect in a certain way so that uh, the sperma, sperma thesi lines up with uh, the male parts of the other worm. So the female parts and the male parts of each worm line up with each other. And then there's seminal fluid that is released by the male parts of each worm. And that seminal fluid, there's a, um, uh, what do you call it? Like a channel on the worm there uh, in this clitellum region that collects the seminal fluid and deposits it into the sperma thesi. Sperma thesi. Uh, so, You've got the sperm being released by each worm. They both have male parts. The, they release the seminal fluid, which it contains the sperm. Uh, it, they're all lined up with their male, female parts uh, connected to each other. The seminal fluid goes into these uh, spermatheci that contains both the ova and then the sperm. And this whole process can take up to an hour from, uh, you know, just a little while to up to an hour. And then when the worms are done and finished, they separate from each other. So that's the copulation part of it. And then they're gonna form cocoons after that. So after mating, they're gonna separate and then cocoons are produced by both worms. So both are hermaphrodites, both have male, female parts. So both of them are gonna produce cocoons. So what happens first is that the clitellum, that band releases a secretion that hardens on the outside. And then after it, has started to harden, the worms move backwards. So um, it's like drawing a t-shirt off of our head. So they had this tube uh, that was made up of this secretion. So just like when we pull our shirt off of our head, if you were to pull your shirt off of your head and then the top closes up and then as you get the rest of the shirt off, the bottom closes up, that's exactly what happens where this tube comes off of them as they crawl backwards the ends close up and it forms this lemon shaped cocoon. So that's why you have those little lemon shapes on the outside rather than a, an oval shape or a circle because of the way that it's formed here. So the cocoon forms and the sperm and the ova are discharged as the tube passes over each spermathesi. So you'll have uh, this tube passing over one of the spermathesi and then a uh, sperm and ova are discharged into that. It goes off the worm, it forms a cocoon. And then within that fertilization takes place and an embryo is formed. So it's a pretty interesting process. And I've included a video to YouTube. I didn't get to search through a lot of videos. Uh, the first two, I believe two minutes, it, it really shows how this act takes place. Um, you can ignore, ignore the rest of the video because it relates to some other type of worm or they're just talking about one worm being um, hatched from the egg, but it shows a good example of how that um, mucus forms a tube and then it comes off of the worm and it, and it forms a cocoon. It's a really neat process. So uh, the ends close and uh, once the worm is free from that tube, the ends close and it forms a cocoon. Um, the uh, This will continue to happen so they can continue to form more cocoons as if there's more um, seminal fluid stored in each spermathesi, they'll have another tube come off, which will form another cocoon until it's all used up. And each of the cocoons contain um, this nutritive protein filled fluid for embryos, uh, similar to like an, a chicken egg. When you see the egg white, it's gonna be that uh, fluid like that, that's uh, full of stuff that these embryos can eat and use for nutrition as they grow inside of the cocoon. And then 
so the as I mentioned, the fertilization takes place externally. They're making a, making a cocoon. The cocoon's got the ova and the sperm, and then fertilization takes place once that's outside of the worm. Um, with the Seniophytida, the average they average uh, production of two to three cocoons per week. And of those two to three cocoons per week, there's anywhere from two to seven worms per cocoon. And on average, you get about three worms that hatch. So uh, you can generally count on having three worms per cocoon that you see um, that are gonna uh, survive, hatch and hatch and then survive. Uh, when they first come out, they're going to appear as golden or amber colored lemon shaped eggs. So they're going to have somewhat of a oval shape with little uh, noses on each side like a, a lemon has. Um, they're about the size of a wood, wooden match head. So if you can picture a wooden match head and that little red match head, that's about the size that they are. Um, and then they're going to darken as the embryos develop. So they start off as a golden amber color and they'll turn to a more darker orange and uh, light to, to brownish color as they um, are getting near where they hatch. And then they're going to hatch anywhere between 30 and 75 days. So under ideal conditions where you've got good temperatures, good moisture levels, they're going to hatch in 30 days. Uh, and it might take up to 75 days if, you know, you've maybe let your uh, moisture dry out or um, something about the conditions it's maybe you know gone very hot or very cold or something like that that's slowing down the process uh, and then when the babies hatch they're going to be white in color and less than a quarter inch long and then within a few days they turn yellowish orange and then they turn their regular red color that you see for the red wigglers um, and if no moisture or food is present the cocoons can remain dormant for days months years um, I found some information from Dr. Clive Edwards, who's done a lot of, he's published a lot of publications and books all about worms. Uh, he's from Ohio State University. And uh, he had found that cocoons can exist for as long as 30 to 40 years. So I wasn't able to find if they're still viable after 30 to 40 years, but they can exist for 30 to 40 years. So, um, you know, in nature, the worms that, uh, they detect or the eggs i should say can detect these dry periods so if they if they think that conditions are going to remain dry then they'll remain dormant until they get more moisture and then um it's all about you know natural uh the knowledge of nature and just kind of those um ingrained things with nature that uh the worm's going to know or within that cocoon they're going to know to hatch or not to hatch uh, and then once you have baby worms, you need to wait for them to reach sexual maturity before they're able to produce more cocoons. So they're going to reach sexual maturity uh, in less than three months. So it takes anywhere from, this is from Rhonda Sherman's book, uh, Worm Farmer's Handbook, the 53 to 76 days. And those figures are based on uh, research that was done that's part of the uh, vermiculture technology book, which is a really thick, nerdy book, brainy book uh, that's um, got a lot of good information in there. Anyway, so about two to two and a half months, you're gonna, your worms that have hatched fr from babies are gonna turn into uh, sexually mature worms that are gonna be able to breed more worms. So you will know this has taken place when your worms develop a clitellum. So that cl clitellum is an indicator that They've gone through puberty or whatever and reached this mature level where they can now breed with each other and form more worms. So um, with those numbers in mind, ideally one worm turns into four in a month's period and those start to quadruple after a couple months. So at that rate, one this is one week's worth of cocoons. So if, you, if you're averaging three cocoons per week, those three cocoons can equal 4,100 worms in about 11 months time if conditions are right. So that's only one week, one week's worth of cocoons. So if they're continuing to produce cocoons, each week's worth after less than a year is gonna produce 4,100 worms if I'm doing the math correctly. And then of those worms, uh, Asinia fetida live, they can live for five years or longer. They've been shown to live for at least four or five years. Um, and it always depends on environmental conditions and how healthy things are in their environment.
So with that in mind, uh, if you're wanting to breed worms, um, providing the best environment is going to increase your worm herd more rapidly. So what can you do? Um, put on some soft, slow mu music and maybe some candles. Just kidding. Uh, you want to keep worm bins uh, higher in moisture for when they're trying to breed. So generally, we're talking about 60% to 75% moisture levels. Um, when you're trying to breed worms, you want that to be even a bit higher at 80 to 85% moisture. So it's going to look pretty soggy in your bins. And you might be even worrying about how soggy it is, but those cocoons need that moisture. You just don't want a lot of standing water. So uh, we'll talk about the trays in just a second here, but generally you're using more shallow trays um, because of the uh, surface area to depth ratio. So because they're more shallow, they're going to dry out more easily. So you need to pay attention and monitor your moisture levels uh, to where you're likely having to spray them down every day or every couple of days if they're in a if you're in a uh, area that has dry heat or doesn't have much humidity there. And then the so the moisture is going to be a bit higher than average, and then the temperature that is good for ideal for cocoon production is going to be a bit lower than is ideal for just regular um, maintenance of worms. So generally we talk about 70, 75 degrees for a nice even temperature or climate controlled temperature for worms to live in. Uh, it's been found through research that a little bit cooler temps uh, promote even more cocoon production. So 60 to 70 degrees, about 65 degrees is a good temperature for breeding worms. Um, and then make sure that you're keeping food in there for them. So even if you don't think that they're hatching right away, you need to make sure that they're using food. You're using some type of food after a few weeks so that they have something to eat on. Um, most people who are breeding worms, it's good to use uh, just so that you have something that's consistent. It's good to use a, a worm chow or commercial worm feed when you're feeding breeder bins. Um, so with all this information in mind, you could have these breeder bins and then watch for cocoons and separate your cocoons. And then we know it takes uh, anywhere between one month and two and a half months for the cocoons to hatch. So that averages out to about every two months, you could check your breeder bins and look for cocoons. So then you'd separate those cocoons, keep the rest of the material and add it in with your other worms or start a new bin with those baby worms and then just realize that it's gonna be about three months before they're gonna reach sexual maturity and able to start producing cocoons again. So you wouldn't wanna go into that. If you had you know, a bunch of babies that you separated into a bin, it would be useless going in there in a month looking for cocoons because it's gonna take a while for them to reach that sexual maturity and start developing cocoons. So um, you can take this all into, take this knowledge and use it to, um, start making and breeding worms. So most people when they're doing breeder bins are using mortar trays or uh, Kim Bolton with a Verma farm had told me she uses bus bins, which I use and I had a picture of here. So I went to, there's a restaurant supply store nearby and oh, these are like somewhere between five and $10. I can't remember exactly how much they cost. I, I They're not close to 10, they're closer to $5 because I wouldn't spend that much money on stuff on cheap. Uh, but they're affordable, they make a good breeder bin, and you can fill those up most of the way and then put your cocoons in there and start breeding worms. Um, and then you just want to make sure and keep those bins covered. So either with um, like some of the hemp or jute fiber covers that we provide through Urban Worm, or um, what works great is a the bubble wrap. The plastic bubble wrap really helps to contain moisture and keep it in. Uh, or even a piece of cardboard if you don't uh, have any other stuff in hand. So I think that's all that I've got to share on that. And then we will go to questions about worm reproduction or anything. Let me get to the comments here. And stop sharing. Uh, let me go look for questions real quick to see what questions that we have in here. We've got a lot of highs from all over. Uh, 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 no questions so far. Hey, from France. 
uh, hey, could there be could there be a point where the worm population is too big for the bin so that the so that splitting the bin contents into two bins would be better to maximize cast production? Um, yeah, generally, well, so yes and no, the worms are gonna regulate their own populations where there's not gonna necessarily be too many worms per bin. Um, so if they don't have the food or the right environmental conditions, they're just gonna regulate their uh, populations so where they're not producing more cocoons. Uh, but if you're, so, and generally we start off at about a thousand worms per square foot of surface area. Um, uh, people who have been worm farming for a while or um, who have a good amount of experience uh, or who have let their worm bins, um, you know, age for a while may have up to like 2000 or 2,500 per square foot. Uh, but again, they're going to regulate their temperatures. But if you're noticing just a ton in there, yeah, of course you could split it and put it into two bins. Um, and if you're wanting to get more castings, that's that's the way to go is to try and get more worm, get your build up your worm population so that you're able to to uh, start more worm bins. Uh, is there a guideline of worms per cubic, cubic foot of worm bin space? I just answered that. Um, one pound is on average about a thousand worms when you're purchasing worms from a a worm breeder or worm seller, uh, you're, there's going to be a, about a thousand per pound. So people order them by the pound. So you would want one pound per square foot of surface area. So the surface area of the top of the your bin, not the cubic space, but the square foot of the surface area. Um, what else? Oh, somebody said music is first on the list. I don't know if they didn't. I, I may have accidentally put the wrong uh, link, but I thought I put the correct link to YouTube. Um, you can just type in earthworm cocoon production, I believe. And it's like this first video that's by an Indian dude. Uh, I believe he's Indian. He, he sounded like he was Indian. I don't want to assume. Um, how do you separate cocoons? Uh, it's a tedious process. Uh, some people enjoy doing it. Some people don't enjoy doing it. Uh, you can purchase, I've heard of some people purchasing um, at like Staples, they have the like outgoing mail things that are made of uh, metal mesh that is a really tiny size that's about an eighth of an inch. And some people will get those little uh, letter uh, paper mesh holders from like a business office supply place. Um, those help to separate out cocoons or generally just going in by hand, uh, depending on how you separate your castings and things like that. Uh, as you're separating your worms from everything, you can pay attention to the cocoons and slowly pull them out. Or if you're using a trommel, generally the cocoons are gonna come out in the uh, in one of your sizes there. So you, you'll be able to sift it and then separate the cocoons out from that. Um, for breeder bins, how many worms is ideal in the bins? Uh, that is a question that I forgot to look up. Um, they were asking how many, how many worms you want in a bin or how many cocoons you would want to add in a bin. And I have that fact in my head. It's just something that I forget. Um, and I'll have to add it, look it up and add it to the comment section or get back to you all on that. How important is the food for new worms? I have lots of pre-composted coffee grounds from a shop I compost and like to sift and feed. Would that be okay for babies? Um, pre-composted pre material, it, you'd probably want it to be just mo more than just coffee grounds. It's good to give a varied diet. Um, but yeah, pre-composted material would be okay for feeding to worms. Um, that The pre-composting of it makes it a bit more stable and um what's the word i'm looking for uh like a worm food is going to be is going to offer a consistent feed so if you're using pre-composted stuff and you have a bunch of it that's going to be a more consistent feed is what i'm trying to get at i let my cft bin dry out how long will cocoons stay viable uh cocoons can stay viable um if i don't know if you didn't hear that part of the thing but um, they can live as long as 30 to 40 years, so they can remain viable for, they should be able to remain viable for a couple of years, um, at least a year, I would say, because they're, 
in nature, they're wanting to um, wait for the right conditions to hatch. Um, and likely it would be less than a year, but uh, I would guess at least that long. What's the best way to keep or store worm castings? Um, you could keep them in. So here's the difficult part. If you keep them in something that's super airtight and they're still rather moist, you have risk them going anaerobic. So you want something that's somewhat breathable. But if you have something that's too breathable, you're going to continuously have to uh, be adding moisture at certain points because you want you don't want to let the worm castings dry out. Um, things, microbes and other things in there are going to go dormant as it dries out, uh, but they're going to stay much more active if you're keeping things moist and it's going to be a lot more viable if you're able to keep things moist. So um, even just, you know, like a, a Rubbermaid tote, if you're able to put it in a Rubbermaid tote and uh, leave it somewhat breathable so that you're getting air in there so that it remains aerobic, but it's not drying out too much. Um, I think I have a mix of reds and blues. Will they mate? No, they're not going to mix and mate. They're just going to mate with their own speed, their own variety there. Um, which size mesh on a trommel separates out the cocoons? Um, most trommels have quarter inch and or eighth inch. Um, uh, sizes and the regular castings are going to come out with the uh, quarter inch and usually the uh, cocoons will come out with the eighth, eighth inch but some will come out in the quarter inch as well. Oh somebody answered uh, the Larry's program so there's a I always forget the name of it there's an online program that you can take if you're interested in learning to breed worms and hopefully somebody who's taken that class can maybe post in the comments the link to that because uh, you can pay for an online course and learn all the even more details on how to breed worms. Uh, so this person, thanks, Susan, for adding that um, they taught to put 500 worms in each breeder bin to start. So thank you for that information. Uh, somebody else asked, how do you, uh, okay to use rabbit manure for worm bins? Yes, um, it's good to let the uh, manure dry down a little bit so it's more on the crumbly side. So uh, it's not going to make the material so hot when you add it to the bin. Um, and it's also going to be easier for it to decompose and for the worms to chew on it. Um, can finely crushed eggshells be used as a grit substitute for sand? Yes, it can be used as a substitute for sand. Um, I usually just add grit every now and then. I'm not usually doing it with every feeding. I'll do it maybe every fourth feeding or something like that, um, just because I don't think that they're going to need they're going to have, uh, I'll add, you know, not a ton, but I'll feel like that there's enough in there from one addition that they can use that up over the next several feedings. But yes, you can use eggshells. That's going to help for grit. Um, you just want to make sure it's not too small in a powder form or something. What is the impact of worm chow on the reproductive process versus just food scraps? Um, I don't have an answer for the, how the, difference between feeding worm chow versus food scraps on how it's going to uh, affect the production of cocoons. Um, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that. It's just the reason I'd mention that is because you're giving such a nice, consistent, uh, consistent nutrition to baby worms and things like that. Um, and also, yeah, uh, I wanted to stress, you know, keep the moisture levels in there too. We were talking about foods here. So I just wanted to again mention that because I had seen on a Facebook group, some lady who had been uh, hatching her worms out on these like dry paper towels. And I feel so sorry because these worms are hatching out going onto these very dry surfaces and they need water um, throughout their life cycle, especially to breathe. So I feel sorry for them having to hatch out onto these dry paper towels or whatever she's using. Um, let's see. Any info on anaerobic? Sometimes when I have a bin that got too wet, I get the larger worms in the bottom. I'm not sure what that question is really asking. Uh, if you do have an anaerobic bin, it, you can stir it up with your hands. 
or, or maybe dump it all out and kind of mix it up and then put it back in there. The worms don't like it as you mix things up. It really disrupts them. But sometimes you have to go in there if you're smelling nasty smells and pull that stuff that was on the bottom and mix it up with stuff that's on the top. Um, if it's super wet, you may even need to add some uh, brown materials. So like some cocoa core, or peat moss, shredded paper, shredded cardboard or something like that. Uh, and I think that's all the questions. Let me check. Oh, follow up substitute for grit. You mentioned grit size wasn't clear. Make sure it's not too small. Question mark. Um, yeah. So some people I see turn eggshells into a powder, which that's going to give you added calcium from the eggshells. But if it's in a powdered form, it's going to be so small that they're not going to be use it, be able to use it as grit. So you need a little bit larger and i don't know the exact um like micrometer size or whatever uh that that needs to be for them to use as grit um that's another thing i can try and find the answer to and get back to you um someone said they seem to love the anaerobic uh when things start to go over anaerobic uh you're gonna get a bit more um microorganisms because there's so much water there's going to be even more microorganism reproduction and because worms are getting their nutrition from microorganisms, you will notice that in more wet areas that they're going to uh, congregate in, in even juicier wet areas like that. Uh, and that's because these microorganisms that they get their nutrients from, so they'll chew through all this material. And just because they're chewing through, you know, cocoa core or something, it's not like they're getting their nutritional benefits from the cocoa core. It's like us. Um, well, I'm trying to think of a good example, but I can't think of something like that. Um, cause there's nothing that we really eat that we don't use up, but they're not going to be really getting any nutrition from coca core or anything like that as they eat, they're getting it from the uh, microorganisms that are in there. So these microorganisms live in micro droplets of water and they're more in like wet conditions. So that's why you'll see more worms in uh the wet areas so again people like to talk about how much worms like watermelon watermelons are super wet and they're also super sweet and so those sugars and that wetness provides a lot of food for microorganisms that's why worms appear to love uh, uh watermelon they're actually loving the benefits that the watermelon is providing to the microbiology that's uh it's feeding so um that looks like it's all the questions Hopefully I'll see some of you this weekend at the NC State Vermiculture Conference. Next week, uh, the Wiggle Wednesday, we're going to cover uh, the highlights of the Worm Conference. So I'll have uh, photos and details of the speakers there and what went on and the good times that we had. So uh, I hope you'll tune in next Wednesday. And again, I hope to see some of this, some of you this weekend. Uh, and again, if you're thinking about uh, Attending online, I would uh, highly suggest it. It's a lot of good information, and you're going to be able to watch that stuff in the future, too. So thanks again for joining in, and I will see you next Wednesday. Have a blessed day, everybody.